change issue, which is not quite the same as climate change and climate change science. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's being observed as been happening and what we're anticipating to happen as we go forward. Um, maybe the front lights could get off, it might be a bit of the screen. And uh, a little bit about energy futures. And, um, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm then going to talk a bit about communicating the issue, and that'll get us a little bit into the, uh, the human behavioural aspect. Um, most of my, I've been 42 years as a climate scientist, and most of my time was spent up here looking at the climate system, working at Aspendale, where we built the first Australian climate model. And we did a whole pile of other things, some of which I'll mention as we go through. We also did a lot of work on impacts, uh, various kinds of impacts of, of climate change. Um, but when, uh, towards the end of my career with CSIR, I got involved in the energy side of things. And most of my work today is on energy futures, not on the climate science. Um, and that in, uh, is underpinned, of course, by things like energy efficiency but also the choice of technologies that we use to provide the energy uh, that we want for mobility, for heating and for power. And of course underpinning that is our demand, what we want as individuals and uh, what drives our gross domestic product. And underneath that is population and affluence. Um, and it's this part that about four years ago I started to work with uh, a psychologist at Monash to try to understand uh, this end of things. Uh, what is it about us, our perceptions, our conscious um, uh, or unconscious decisions, our views about well-being and so on, that really drive our energy demand and then ultimately this problem and then make it difficult for us to actually do anything about it. So let's uh, uh, start with the observations. I thought I'd just throw this in just to remind you this is nothing new. Uh, the fact that these gases influence the radiation budget in the atmosphere has been known since 1861. Using this apparatus, a scientist uh, published in the Royal Society of London uh, to show how these gases work. We knew that the planet's temperature was dependent uh, in part on these gases. And then this tells you when I started at CSIRA, because we started measuring from aircraft around Australia uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide with very high degree of accuracy. At that stage, there are only a couple of groups in the world. And in fact, the reason why we started was because uh, we were sceptical. Uh, there was one person in the US making these measurements, and he said that the concentration of this gas is going up, and we thought he had drifting standards. And we went out to prove him in, and we knew very quickly, of course, that he was right. And then we actually established in Cape Grim in Tasmania a permanent observing station that started in 1976 and is still operating. Um, and this, together with now a handful of these stations around the world, gives us a very clear picture of what's happening to this gas. There are other greenhouse gases, but this gas is the main greenhouse gas. As a result of these gases being in the atmosphere, the temperature of the planet is going up. These are um, three different organisations that have made an assessment of what the global average surface temperature is and uh, showing how it's going up. Um, it goes up and down a lot. And in fact, nearly all of these little troughs here are when we've had La Ninas. Uh, this is a particular kind of weather system that dominates the temperature of the planet the opposite to El Nino's, which are these peaks. And uh, the last two years, uh, very unusually, we've got two La Ninas in a, in a row, and we've had two quite cool years. So this, uh, this would, if we went up to here, it would drop down here. I just didn't have the data for that. Um, but of course, uh, if you are opposed to this idea, uh, and you're a, a um, a shock jock in a radio station, you might compare that point with that point and say the temperature is going down. And people have done this. Uh, but if you look at this data, I think you can see that the overall trend is uh, an upward temperature. 
Um, now there are two things that you would expect uh, really from, from uh, basic uh, science at, uh, uh, at high school uh, that might happen. The first thing is that if you actually warm the ocean, the water will expand and uh, the sea level will go up. And this is actually what's happened to sea level. Most of the time, this is, over, this is since 1880, uh, we've had to depend on sea level gauges that were placed in bays like Port Phillip, um, but around the world, mainly just to, uh, to control uh, the movement of shipping. Um, they were never set up for this purpose, for monitoring long term. Um, but it turns out that they're okay, but in the last period of time, we've now got altimeters on satellites that can actually see the surface level of the seas almost daily and tell you exactly what's happening. And this uh, diagram simply shows that when we reconstruct the sea level rise from these tide gauges, uh, you get pretty much close to the same answer as from the much more uh, effective satellites. Um, the second thing is that you expect there might be less snow and ice around. And I put this slide in because this slide was made uh, by the National Snow and Ice Data Centre in uh, Colorado uh, on the 13th of October. Just after this year we uh, went through the minimum of ice cover of the Arctic Ocean. And what it shows is that the average from 1980 to 2000, which is here, and then we had in 2007 an exceptionally low year but this year we exceeded it. So that the sea level, the um, ice cover in the Arctic is disappearing uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and something that this diagram doesn't show is that um, it's actually a little worse than that because the ice that is left is mostly only one year old. It's thin. And so we only have to have the right meteorological conditions some year, sometime in the next year or 10 years uh, and we'll lose it for at least one year uh, in the summer. And for some people, they see this as fantastic. Um, if you actually want to cruise around this part of the Earth, um, then this, is, this will be great to have no ice there. Um, or if you want to get at the resources that are on the bottom of the ocean here, you'll also do the same. So it's no coincidence that these countries have already increased their military activity within the era um, because as the Canadian um, uh, president actually said, uh, prime minister, sorry, actually said, um, part of the possession in this area, because these areas are not designated to belong to any country, uh, is simply whether you're present there. It's a little like us having the stations in Antarctica. It's part of the reason we're there. And they're doing the same sort of thing. There's great interest in this. Uh, now, the other observations we have of, of ice, that, sea, that ice, when it melts, doesn't make any difference to sea level. It's floating. But of course, the ice that's in Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheet, these are the two big ice sheets of the world that are up on the land, if they melt, they do change the sea level. And uh, we had sort of almost anecdotal information about patches of this ice melting and so on up until early this century. And then we had another satellite, or pair of satellites actually, uh, that were put up and they fly in tandem around the Earth. And uh, <clears throat> they very, very precisely measure the distance between the two satellites. And as they, go, as they go over areas where the gravity changes, they move slightly closer and further apart. And, and using this, you can detect the volume of water that's underneath the satellite. So, for example, it's been used to measure the mass of water in big lakes in Africa. But here it's been used to measure the mass of ice in Antarctic and Greenland. And clearly, the ice masses are going down. And if you add up the amount of change, the billions of tons here, as they go down, and convert that to uh, water lying all over the oceans of the world, it adds up to about a millimetre a year. 
of sea level rise. So this is additional sea level rise to the fact that the oceans are warming and uh, that's also causing sea level rise because the water is expanding. So the total sea level rise, because of these two effects, is about three millimetres a year around the globe, average over the globe. And I'll come back to that after. Um, I did want to mention that, of course, while we know quite a lot about some of these things, we know enough about some things to be uncertain what could happen and know that things could collapse. And this is not an attempt to uh, scare the pants off it, because in fact I'll talk about that later when I talk about some of the human behaviour issues. But it is true that the thermohyaline ocean circulation, and the main part of that that you'd be familiar with is the movement north uh, in Europe of water, the Gulf Stream, where it sinks into the deep ocean and then actually comes back up into the southern ocean. That circulation is slowing down as we warm the planet. And uh, there are some dynamical reasons to believe that it could stop suddenly. And if it did, that would, ha that would be a major problem. We wouldn't want that to happen because it would change European climate significantly. It's the only mechanism whereby oxygen gets into the deep ocean. So without it, no life would exist in the deep ocean. Um, and it would actually slow down the capacity of the oceans to take up carbon dioxide and therefore speed up climate change. So we, we wouldn't want this to happen. We have no reason to believe it's going to happen, um, at least in, the, in this century, but we have to watch that. It's possible. Similarly, there could be rapid deglaciation and loss of gases out of the permafrost. We know there's a lot of methane underneath the permafrost in the northern hemisphere, and we don't want that to come out. That would be dangerous. Um, we know that uh, the rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere because of what we're putting into the atmosphere, is being slowed a bit because over the last two decades, the plant coverage of the world, the forests, have actually increased. Despite deforestation, overall, the uptake of carbon is, is uh, being greater. Uh, we don't really want that to happen to, to stop because it's actually slowing things down. Um, but most of the biologists that look at this uh, are convinced that it won't last for too long. Um, that you come to a new equilibrium and then you start to uh, have no net uptake. And uh, finally, we know that to some extent, the warming that we've seen over the last um, 30 or 40 years has been damped out by the dustiness of the particles we've put into the atmosphere. And of course, people, particularly at the moment in Asia, uh, people want to get rid of that. And so the moment they clean up their power stations and don't put it in, the temperature of the planet will go up faster. Now, how much faster, we don't know for sure. So there's a chance. So these are what we call uh, wild cards or tipping points that could suddenly actually confuse the whole thing and really want to manage the risk and try to avoid those sorts of things being possible. Um, this is a snapshot of other evidence. Um, and I could have put pages of this up. Interesting that I was mentioning it before to others that I've been very busy, and I've been very busy over the last week because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is about to bring up its fifth report. And uh, I've got the, pro the uh, task of reviewing a number of those chapters. Each one of these chapters is about 200 pages. Each chapter refers to 1,200 peer-reviewed journal articles. These are massive amount of information. So I could have actually printed pages and pages of this, but these are some, uh, some examples. Warming in the upper ocean is occurring. The lower eight kilometers of the atmosphere is, is occurring. Uh, extreme temperatures are, are changing in their frequency, CSIRO data. A increased water vapor uh, in the atmosphere, which itself is a greenhouse gas, uh, is occurring. That's now observed. Global water cycle is changing, that's uh, observed by looking at the salinity of the surface oceans. Cyclones uh, since 1970 uh, have increased in their intensity, although we don't have any clear indication of increase in numbers. Rainfall, wave height and wind patterns over the southern ocean from satellites, we can now detect the change. They're becoming larger in their heights uh, of the waves. Acceleration of Greenland uh, ice, I've just shown you, that's actually happening. 
more acidic oceans, which is a side effect as you put CO2 into the surface of the oceans, you acidify it, and that's got the important issues, not climatological issues, but issues for uh, shellfish uh, and corals. And uh, this last one, um, I'll, I'll say in a moment, is the one that worries me, probably because I was originally trained as a biologist. We're seeing enormous changes in plant distributions and animal distributions, uh, but also in their behaviour. Um, and uh, uh, some of those things, I think, are, are, uh, are much more important than generally thought. But to be a bit closer to home, and a little less general, this diagram shows what most of you will learn in primary school, and that is that air, as it's heated in the tropics, rises and sinks into the mid-latitudes and sinks. And where it sinks, it's dry, and that's why we have deserts in the middle latitudes and we happen to lie under one of these pressure belts. That's what that is. Um, and it moves slightly north and south uh, from summer to winter and that's why we have seasons here. But on average we're in a rather dry area because of this belt. Well this diagram shows that since 1900 to uh, almost present in this diagram, uh, the mean uh, pressure um, which is this black line has been going up uh, with the mean temperature of the planet. Uh, now the whole point of this diagram is that correlations between two curves like that don't prove that one's caused the other, but we've got a lot of other evidence that this circulation, this what is known by the scientists as a Hadley circulation, is intensifying and that's leading to the zones where it descends moving poleward. And the fact that we've had since the 1970s in Western Australia and over the last 15 years in southern uh, uh, eastern states, uh, a lot less rainfall on average is because of this movement uh, south. So here is a demonstration of an impact that is occurring now uh, on the climate of our region. And it's led to actually quite a complicated uh, pattern. Because if we look at the, uh, the average rainfall, what it's done is it's caused this drying across here and up the east coast, but actually quite significant wetting in the north and western part of the country. Um, and uh, what's really happened is that this is late autumn, early winter. That's when all the action has been. So it's the westerly frontal systems that have been the dominant for, form of rainfall for our area that has actually stopped providing this. So even during these last two years, when we had this large amount of rainfall, in that season we didn't. We actually had a, still a much lower than average amount. What's happened is we've made up for it in the spring and summer. So we have this complicated balance between loss of rainfall from the frontal patterns uh, with some indication that we may actually compensate a bit from that uh, in our region at least uh, by having uh, more summer rainfall. Either way, it's a significant change to our climate system that um, we, but also all of the other species that we share the uh, Victorian with have to deal with. Uh, and I put the slide in, as I said, because I think uh, as a biologist we are observing changes in species distributions, in some cases genetics, uh, Melbourne University have been studying the genetics of fruit flies uh, right down the eastern coast of Australia, and there are particular pairs of genes that, that are very sensitive to temperature, and, uh, and if you use those and collect these species throughout a year, you can actually see the annual cycle of temperature in the frequency change of those genes. Well, that gene frequency has shifted southwards uh, by about 400 kilometres. And that's about what they expect because the temperature's gone up nearly a degree. So the things are happening in these systems about which we really know almost nothing. And uh, for those of you who watch the the show on the um, botanic gardens last night and the, and the flowers, uh, you will see that there was talk about how uh, you can have, remove one insect, uh, that influences the pollination of a plant and that influences 
the feeding for a higher animal, and you don't know what you're going to do if, if you lose one species. So it's very dangerous to let anything go. And here we are doing an experiment which we have absolutely no idea how these complex systems are going to respond. To me, that's <coughs> one of the more serious issues about which not much is uh, said. Now, <coughs> when the, um, the government was uh, trying to put together uh, its plans for uh, a trading scheme, carbon trading scheme, uh, I was asked by the Treasury to actually prepare a document to give the economists, primarily economists within the Treasury, some feel for the risk of allowing the concentrations of these gases to go up to different levels. And that's what this diagram does. It's a bit complicated, um, but it's, up here it has the amount of temperature change that would occur for the planet, which is approximately the same as what would occur in Australia. Uh, and down here in the green are the sorts of ranges of change that we think we can cope with. Now, every system's got a degree of coping capacity. And then the yellows here are areas where we might be able to cope by adapting, by actually intervening in the system, uh, whether it be water availability, coastal communities, energy security, or whatever. <coughs> and the red regions are where uh, we could see no, we couldn't see what we would be able to do. We, we had no adaptive capacity beyond that. And so this shows you that for water availability in Australia, we think that by the time we get to a two degree change, uh, which as we're going will be well before the end of the century, um, we would run out of, of coping capacity. And the same would apply for coastal communities, and some of you are interested in this, and some uh, would also apply to natural ecosystems. Um, these are approximate. Um, we might, from what I've said, think this might come lower, but we don't know for sure. And these little bars are simply <coughs> what we expect the warming to be for different future levels of the gases in the atmosphere. Uh, this, for example, is what we would get uh, if we go as business as usual. By 2100, which is this bar here, we expect to be up to about 4.5 degrees if we don't do anything. Um, that leaves us in the red areas for all of these things. We don't want that to happen. No one wants that to happen. The European Union, um, about 10 years ago, set a target of not allowing the temperature to go beyond 2 degrees. We'll come back to that in a moment. So we have to manage risk. <coughs> and um, those of you who come out of business, you, you probably know this kind of thing very well, because actually business is managing risk all the time. You never know for sure what's going to happen. And we don't know for sure what's going to happen in the climate system with any degree of detail. Um, and you also have to know uh, what the consequences of that are. So risk is about balancing the probability of some change occurring about the importance if it does happen. And that gives you your potential exposure that defines the risk. And then you can spontaneously adapt. And the fruit flies up and down the east coast of Australia are doing that by shifting. That's spontaneous adaption. We're not out there helping them do anything. They're doing it themselves. And that can happen. But ultimately, whatever's left over is vulnerability. And you can manage that by coming back and trying to mitigate by lowering the emissions in the first place and not allowing this to happen, lowering the probability of change, or you can come here, in here and manage uh, through adaptation. <coughs> in this state of uncertainty, um, we have to do the best we can. Uh, we don't know everything uh, that we'd like to know. Um, we have to manage the risk nonetheless. And there are several things we can do. We can retain a portfolio of options. Don't put all of our eggs in one basket um, because we're not sure it's the right basket. Uh, keep options open. And regular review policy and approaches in light of new knowledge. We have to keep trying to learn as much as we can about the future. Uh, now, with regard to managing risk, of course, the people who do this extremely well are the insurance business. That's how they make their money. 
And this slide comes from Munich Re, Munich Re Insurance, uh, <clears> that has offices here now, a uh, German company. Um, and this shows you um, the insurance losses, the, dark, uh, the economic losses, sorry, in these lighter blues, uh, as we go through from 1950 uh, to nearly the present. Um, I tried to actually get this updated, but I, I couldn't. I, I need to uh, go back to some uh, colleagues and get that. But basically what it shows is that um, uh, these companies are very aware of the fact that uh, the frequency of, of disasters, uh, climate change driven natural disasters, is increasing. Uh, and it's increasing quite dramatically. These peaks up here, which were climate driven, it was 178 billion US dollars, greater than that. This is 113 billion US dollars that those events cost. They're enormous. Uh, the black, the grey boxes are just simply the decadal averages behind there. Now, 1988, we held here at Monash, actually, the first national climate change science meeting. And um, we and Munich Re really sent a guy out from Germany then to give a keynote address on the insurance, the relevance of this insurance industry. The insurance industry are way ahead of nearly every other industry in looking at climate change. They know that things are changing, and they also know that there are other reasons, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But they are also quite confident that part of it's climate change. So the insurance industry, for example, spent quite a lot of time with the Queensland government trying to convince the Queensland government to uh, take a number of policy actions to minimise the exposure to uh, extreme cyclones on that coast. One of the um, agreements uh, that I don't think ever culminated anything was that each, at least each of the main settlements up the Queensland coast should have one um, level five cyclone proof building so that people could escape into that building because most of the buildings won't survive that kind of level of cyclone. And there was an agreement by the government up there that they would do that. Right? And I'm not sure that they went through it. They're through with it. Of course, there are other reasons why that cost might uh, have occurred. And this is a picture of the Gold Coast in 1966 compared with today. So obviously the exposure on that coast from a dollar point of view as well as from a human point of view is enormously different. So a storm that would have hit that coast of the same magnitude at this time as today would have had markedly different impacts. So part of that uh, rise in curve is because there's more people around and there's more investment in property. Despite that, the insurance industry is quite confident uh, <clears throat> that part, in part it's due to climate change and that they've been actively out there behind the scenes trying to um, get uh, supportive governments to actually minimise uh, the exposure. At the end of the day, as we were talking before um, uh, we started tonight, um, insurance companies are there to make money and they can actually be an extremely important part of the community in terms of smoothing out some of these issues uh, for individuals or small communities as part of the whole. But they can only do so much and what they've been trying to do is to convince uh, governments to work in uh, concert with them to make sure that stupid things like the kinds of building uh, permits that are left in some places, the kind of regulations with regard to the kinds of buildings and so on, uh, take into consideration that there is this exposure as we go forward in time. <coughs> this is a picture, again, I, um, I couldn't update, um, so it only goes to 2004, but it, it tells the story I want to, to show you, and that is that if you take all of the, uh, the 20 top insurance disasters uh, in Australia up until January 2004, every one of them, except that one, was weather related. And that one was the Newcastle earthquake. 
Um, again, uh, insurance companies are very aware of that. They're right in the middle of this. And these are uh, related to the Cyclone Tracy, but hail storms in Sydney were particularly uh, dominant. Um, and we know that in a way we've been a bit, a bit fortunate in Sydney uh, that the hail storms, particularly the storms that have that driven those um, exposures, uh, came within 20 or 30 kilometres of doing 10 times the damage that they did. We we're just fortunate that it didn't happen. Again, they're aware of this. So, what are the insurers, uh, reinsurers saying? Uh, between 1994 and 2003, there are almost three times as many weather related natural catastrophes as in the 1960s. Economic losses increased by a factor of five. The main causes in both cases were floods and windstorms. Very aware of this. And Swiss Re, another big company, there is a danger that human intervention will accelerate and intensify natural climate change to such a point that it will be impossible to adapt our social economic systems in time. Uh, these are fairly serious statements uh, by companies that um, their whole life depends on managing these risks. Now there are, in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's what this stands for here, in the last report that came out about five years ago, uh, they identified <coughs> um, some major sea level ad adaptation options related to inundation or increasing flooding of low-lying islands. Um, some of you will be aware that the Pacific Island nations together have been very strong lobbyists internationally to try to get some action because some of those islands uh, already have serious problems uh, with loss of beaches but also um, saltwater intrusion into fresh water supply. But major concerns about densely populated deltaic uh, areas in, uh, in uh, South uh, Asia. Uh, loss of coastal wetlands and ecosystems, some of which you'll be familiar with here. Erosion of developed sandy beach coaches, which all of you will be familiar with here. This is happening uh, in our bay. Uh, and uh, there's a wide range of adoption policies, but they're built around retreating, accommodating, or protecting. Those are the main uh, approaches. Easy to say, but in fact, when you look at those options, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, each one has a, a whole pile of different sub-options that exist in here and getting actions to do anything about this particular state level seems to or the federal level seems to have been quite limited um, but I know that most of the councils down the bay are uh, quite concerned about this um, but you know the inertia of the system make it very difficult to get uh, action. The impacts on the globe, go, I want to make a couple of points here um, the first point is that global mean future sea level um, is a poor indicator of what your exposure is. Um, the report that was uh, talked about in the, in the Age on Sunday, I think it was, um, I haven't seen it, but I'd be very surprised if it doesn't make this point quite strongly. The real exposure, for a start, the sea level is not level. It has all these hills and valleys in it, that relates to a number of things, but primarily uh, where you sit under a high pressure system, like we do, this high pressure ridge, that suppresses sea level. Um, and so the sea level rise around the Australian coast associated with a global average sea level rise of about 25 centimetres uh, has been nearly three times as big in the northwest as is in the southeast. These are big differences. So it has to do with the pressure systems but also the topography uh, and the uh, systems of uh, ocean currents. Um, so there are uncertainties in the global sea level rise, but it worries me when people actually are thinking about planning for a 90 centimetre change in sea level. Uh, 90 centimetres will happen as a global average at some point in time, but it won't apply anywhere, because it will be different everywhere. The second thing, of course, is but the greatest impacts are likely to result from significant isolated events, um, like the events we had in Port Phillip uh, earlier this year, where you have a single uh, low pressure system 
And you can do the calculations here, but um, if you change the pressure between a high pressure system and then a low pressure comes across, it's easy, and we did in, the, in one of these events, get a 70 centimetre rise at sea level, simply related to the pressure of the air. Nothing to do with uh, sea level rise. Of course, if you've already got an extra 20 centimetres there, that makes it worse. But it'll be this that actually comes to bite us. It'll be a big event where we get an exceptionally low pressure system comes through at the wrong time, that is at a high tide, and we get a lot of inundation. Um, but it interacts, so every part of the bay and every part of our coastline in Australia will be different because we have different historical planning arrangements, different levels of exposure, of population, and coastal geomorphology is different. And part of the problem around the bay is, uh, like where my laboratory was at Aspendar, the beaches are almost already, always already gone. Um, we've only got to get one of these large storms there and then people really will have uh, problems with water up to the foundations of those houses. Uh, millions of dollars worth of houses. Uh, and the human structures, whether they be houses and other structures, um, that we've done all modifications, um, such as uh, the one that uh, I know some of you are concerned about, uh, which was the dredging of the bay. So energy futures. Underpinning all of this is the way we use energy. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a picture that says globally average now, um, if we want to not go beyond two degrees, which is what the European Union's target is, because beyond that they think it's dangerous. Some scientists like myself, because of our concern over the biology, think it's less. Uh, it's down here. But if we say that that's the target, then what that tells us is that we have to peak our emissions by 2015, globally. Uh, now, I'm an optimist at heart, but I cannot see that happening. Uh, we're talking about a few years' time convincing the world to decrease its emissions um, on average. Um, which means that uh, because some countries, uh, for legitimate reasons, uh, developing will need to increase their emissions. Some of us will have to dramatically decrease our emissions. It's very hard to see this happen. But the point about this diagram too is that we're uncertain about that number. And this is the range of uncertainty. So even if we did that, uh, we have about a 50% chance that we would exceed the 2 degrees. So the chance of actually not reaching 2 degrees seem uh, almost um, impossible. And this is part of the reason why. Each of these little graphs now is the fossil fuel CO2 emissions um, in picograms or uh, gigatons, thousand million tons of carbon per year up here. Each of them, uh, no, that, on that one. And this is a year in each one from 1990 to 2010. The black dots is of what the globe did what we all did. We all contributed to making these emissions and back here the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tried to project what was going to happen over the next 10 or so years and those coloured lines were different ideas of what might happen depending on what China did and who did this and so on. And you'll see that what we actually did was at the upper limit of all of those things that we actually anticipated only in 2000. Um, the little red line, which you can probably hardly see, uh, happened because of the financial crisis. And I have another slide, but because of time I've taken it out. But we bounced back the very next year to a number higher. So we're up here again. So there's no evidence that concern over climate change has done anything to CO2 emissions growth. The second thing is that here is the reason gas emissions Emissions from the production of cement and from oil are all going up, but coal has gone up a lot. That's the main uh, area of growth. If we actually divide the world up into uh, people, the, uh, the um, green dots, people like ourselves in the developed world, we find we haven't actually done all that much uh, more over time. And that's not because of Australia, because we've had quite a significant increase here. But 
countries in a number of countries in Europe have significantly reduced their emissions, the UK and, Ger and Germany two example. But this is the non annex B countries, this is the developing countries. They're the ones where all the growth has been. These are the ones whose um, energy use per capita is a tenth of ours, and they're looking to actually have our lifestyles, and that's what they're trying to do, and that's why that's going up. But it's not only that either, because in this diagram, the ratio of uh, the amount used per person is shown. And so what this shows is that this huge growth has occurred in the last uh, five or ten years that relates simply to affluence. That every individual wants more energy to do the things they think they need to do. So it's a changing circumstance. And so the International Energy um, Authority, which is probably one of the more conservative bodies in the world, didn't really recognise climate change until about five years ago, um, made this statement uh, last year. What is needed is little short of an energy revolution. We can't go on doing what we've been doing uh, with the climate change issue, either to meet growing demand or to meet the climate change issue. So in our country, we have the Securing a Clean Energy Future document, which is the policy of the Labor Party at the moment. And the good thing about this was um, that it actually recognised it couldn't do everything there wasn't a simple answer. So they said, well, we'll try to set a price on carbon, uh, eventually going into a carbon trading scheme. But we'll also develop renewable energy, and we'll invest in that. We'll also try to press for more energy efficient use, and we'll also try to convince the farmers of Australia to change the way they practice their land use to get some of the carbon stored back in vegetation. Uh, so they were saying a price on carbon alone was not enough. Uh, it was more about a future energy strategy. And any of you who are interested in this only have to look at the draft white paper on energy futures that has been produced earlier this year, which is still out under discussion. It's terrible. It's not a strategy at all. The good news is <coughs> this is a picture of Australia's electricity consumption. And for, if, you, if you went back in this, this would have been growing a growing curve at around about 2% per year for a long time. In fact, I remember when I first came to Victoria, the State Electricity Commission had these enormous projections of what they thought we would need into the future. And this is what's happened. It stopped growing. And it stopped, we don't know exactly why it stopped, but it's probably a combination of intervention a lot of us have actually put in home insulation, efficient light bulbs, solar feedback tariffs and have helped people put in panels, and public awareness. Some people are doing some of these things simply because they're aware that there is an issue. But there is a market uh, issue as well. Market prices, um, partly associated with the uh, carbon price, but also as you've seen in the discussion in the newspapers in the last week or so, there's all sorts of other games being played around why the price is going up. And commercial advertising. Individuals out there saying some ludicrous things about trying to sell their products, blaming it all on carbon pricing. But the, the good thing about it is, of course, it's actually making some people to, uh, make some changes, even though it's quite, in my view, quite dishonest. So we have actually stemmed the flow of electricity use, which is um, about half of our emissions. Um, but we need to bring them down. So, communicating the issues. That's right, what scientists did, um, and I was involved in this in 1988, was we set up this thing called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, a report every five or six years, and it, it is a process which takes all of the published material, only stuff that's been peer reviewed in journals, and summarizes that. Uh, in an assessment um, every five or six years, and that is was designed, and it also is attached to it as a um, a summary for policymakers. It was designed to take the best information from the science community and deliver it into policymakers, public and private. And it has been, I think, very successful. But of course, it simplifies the matter. There's a whole pile of other 
leakages that take place through here. You know, in my career, I've been involved in all of these sorts of things, um, including trying to influence the media from time to time uh, as we've gone forward. But the idea of having this gradient, gradient of colour here is to indicate that it's not a simple process. It's not as if there is a wall there with a scientist on one hand and they can open a door and pass through the piece of information for policy makers. It's a human communication issue and it's complicated and in fact on every one of these, if you look at it carefully, you can find ways it can be manipulated. And in most cases you can find where, places where it has been manipulated for political reasons, for economic reasons. So it's a complicated process. But probably more importantly is that as a scientist, I always felt that my reason for existence, and particularly being paid for by taxpayers, was that I had to actually, where there were potential threats, identify them to inform risk management for the development of public and private policy, and to inform the wider community so that they would provide public support for those who had the courage to develop policy. And many of them don't, of course. But what I found out only after many years was there's enormous filter in here between the information that we might have. And you're going to be placed scientists up here with other experts in the community. It can be economists, it can be engineers, people who actually, through their disciplines, know a lot about one particular issue that's relevant to policy development. And the first of these, of course, is that there's a whole pile of behavioural issues. Um, I found that, for example, what I believe was a rational argument, rationality is actually circumstantially determined in the community. Uh, the behavioural scientists and psychologists know a lot about this. I didn't know anything about it, I'm a physical scientist. But I found that um, when you, if I gave a very threatening message, and I think I mentioned this before, to a, a group of people like this, what the behavioural scientist told me that I didn't understand was that actually each of you would actually respond emotionally differently. And that really is hard, therefore, for someone to communicate uh, an issue. And what's more, they would cope with that emotion, because these were usually unwanted emotions, with different coping mechanisms. Uh, I was at a meeting only recently, and the guy said, threaten everyone as hard as you can, because they'll do what I'm doing, and that is they out, go out there and do stuff. And that's a coping mechanism. He had the coping mechanism that if everyone else had, we probably wouldn't have a problem. He's actually responded. But of course, other coping mechanisms are um, skepticism, denial, uh, blame others. You know, it's actually Chinese fault, uh, or it's Kevin Rudd's fault, it's someone else's problem. Beliefs and ideologies, I'll come back to that in a moment, vested interests and targeted skepticism and institutional structures. Sectorised society makes it very difficult for us to get holistic responses uh, when in fact everyone's working for different purposes within our community. And, um, and an issue that uh, I won't dwell on here which has to do with the way our social structures have evolved. <coughs> now from a scientist perspective, um, what we try to do is to Describe the way we see the world on a rational basis. That is, we take observations and measurements and rational deduction and say this is what we think the real world looks like. And we can do that um, in a sectorally or disciplinary defined way, which is the way most science is done, uh, because we learn our science in that way. If you go to Monash, you'll find each department is doing its little discipline. Uh, or we can try to, which is becoming more common now, to do it more holistically, which is more useful. Where simultaneously you're looking at the economics, you're looking at the physical realities, uh, you're looking at the, um, <clears throat> the biological realities and so on. And anyhow, you can feed that into evidence-based policy. And if you talk to policy makers, particularly in governments, uh, and some of you may be from, the, from those areas, They'll put their hand up and say, yes, we want to base our policy on evidence. Evidence-based policy is an in thing. The reality is, is that all of us, me included, in this room, 
never have enough of this information about the whole reality of the world. So we have to construct our view of the world. We have bits of it, and in my case it's climate bits, that I actually have a rational basis for believing the world is, but in other areas I don't. So I construct the way the world is based heavily on subjective perceptions, rules, regulations, culture, religion, who I spoke to last at the golf club, uh, all of these things influence. And these, are, these are dominant in our views of the world. And my view of that, of course, is that we construct a non-reality world. It's not what we're trying to achieve up here, which is a description of the real world. It's a non-reality world. But we have to face the fact that policy is developed uh, being influenced by both of these. And this is a real threat, I think, not only for climate change, but for other issues. And John F. Kennedy made this statement, which I love, because in the climate science uh, in community, uh, you will know as well as anyone uh, that there are people who we regard skeptics out there. Uh, there may even be some here, I don't know. But there are some very important people who had quite an influence through the skeptic position. And Kennedy uh, reinforced a view that I, I developed, but only fairly recently. Uh, and that is that actually that's not that important. Uh, these people only survive because the rest of us are living with myths. And we want to hear what we want to hear. Um, and belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. It's the real danger that exists within the the community for the climate change issue. So there are things that you can do, and I'm going to finish now because we've gone well over my time. Um, and many of you will be doing these sorts of things. Understand your energy and water footprints, how much you use, from what activities, with what flexibility, what changes you can make. It's very difficult for me to change. My biggest emissions are from flying, because my business means I have to go to the state a lot. Um, hard to do much about that, but as I could do it, I had done a lot about other initiatives. It's very empowering because you then have personal options. You can make your own decisions about what you do, not wait for the power company to do it for you. You can set targets for reduction. You can monitor your power and gas and petroleum bills. Some of you might already do this. Uh, you can assess the dollars and the carbon that you save, and you can reward success of your kids if they help you do it or of your employees if you're in business and you try to take your company with you. Um, be educated, equipped to make better purchases when you're actually dealing with energy issues. But above all, tell others, especially local and regional government uh, and teachers, because what we really need is leaders. We don't have any uh, in our governments at the moment in this regard. Um, it is true that there are a number of big companies in Australia that are doing great things. And I don't have time to go through those, but there are some really good ones. <coughs> and in most cases, it's come from a, a, a director of a board or a CEO who's had the courage to say, we're going to do this. And we need more of that. We need more leadership. But each of us can be a leader in our own way. And if you want more facts about the climate change issue, there are many um, sites, websites that you can go to. These are a few. A lot of the academies of science, including the Academy of Science here in Australia, uh, but all around the world, the Royal Society of London is the, is the big English academy. Um, but also agencies like the Bureau of Meteorology, NASA, and NOAA in, in um, the US, uh, many of these have sites which show um, the details of the science. Um, people do, uh, tend to ignore this and it comes back to uh, why is it ignored? It's because it doesn't deliver the messages that many people want to hear. It doesn't satisfy their worldview uh, and uh, therefore they don't, uh, they don't follow it. So there is a risk from climate change that urgently needs to be managed. I think it's more urgent than what most people think. Energy futures uh, uh, will be different from now. Uh, that's, that's for sure. These changes are taking place everywhere. Uh, we need strategic and holistic planning. Um, and from this point of view of that early slide I showed you, 
It's really about actually having some idea of where you want to be. What kind of society do we want? It's not incrementally uh, get, trying to get you a few percent from this year to the next. It's about having some idea of where you want to go. To do that, you need leadership, uh, and we're, we need to share responsibilities. It's no good sitting back and saying, well, we'll wait until the Chinese do something. And China's already doing a lot more than Australia, a hell of a lot more than we are, and they have been for some time. But they have a huge population, and they have to deal with that. Recognition that we <coughs> have caused a problem, and only collectively we can respond to it and have, as I say, a clearer vision about where we really want to be. Thank you.